All right, so we are live. I'm going to go ahead and give a brief introduction. Uh, so thank you so much for joining me for the Meet the Curator event series. This series is made possible by the Harold S. Seabrook Charitable Trust and the Klein Family Foundation. I'm Jane Jewell, the curator of the Arts and Science Center for Southeast Arkansas. And today I am talking to artist Crystal Seawood. Uh, Seawood is a self-taught artist from Forest City who is currently teaching English in Washington, D.C. She received a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in Digital Arts and Design from Henderson State University in Arca, Philadelphia. And Seawood believes her work to be an act of justice, primarily serving whose identities have been typecast through the rendering of other people's imaginations. In the fall of 2019, ASC hosted the solo exhibition of Seawood's works titled Boys to Black Men. This year is the keeper of his dreams. So, Crystal, thank you so much for joining us. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and dive into questions. So do you want to give a background into sort of who you are as a person educationally, um, your experiences as a child, and sort of how you got into the art world and um, what you've been up to? I'll let you dive in. Sure. I have to give a lot of credit to uh, my development as an artist to my high school art teacher. Um, Mr. Don Williams. He was really, really important in just like um, teaching me about color. Cause like I was self-taught, my art career began when I was probably old enough to form words. I think I was always making doodles and stuff. But I do have a memory in the second grade. I think I liked apple juice and I still love apple juice by the way. One of my peers asked me to draw like one of their assignments for class mm -hmm. and so I was like I'll trade you for apple juice so I that is like a memory that the like first tangible memory I have of like mark art making and um as I grew up my focus was on portraiture I've mm -hmm. always been invested in people's stories and so I just would spend hours upon hours in my room every day drawing. So it kind of began there, but then my, my purpose with my work kind of didn't like start to come together until like in the recent years, honestly. I just think I had to experience life to like really figure that out. So, you know, I don't know if that you can relate to like, I don't know when you're in college and you're just, you're in school and you're preparing for your future, but you, you still like don't have this awareness of like this bigger purpose. So mine came a little later in life. Like teaching is my second career. I was first a graphic designer for five years, but then I hated sitting behind a, a computer desk all day. And I decided to quit my job. I moved back home with no plan. I really, I didn't have a job for maybe like eight or nine months, but I went to visit my old art teacher, Mr. Williams, and kind of would sit side by side with the kids, looking over their shoulders, giving them tips. And I eventually started to substitute teach just to like earn some little extra money on the mm -hmm. side. And a student one day said that I needed to be a teacher. And so that was like the furthest thing from my mind. And and when I thought about it, I told the, I told the student, I said, okay, prove it. The next day, this student comes, her name is Tiana Murphy. I don't know if she's um, watching, but I think she is a, in college now, but she brought me this letter detailing mm -hmm. why I should be a teacher and why I would make a good teacher. And one of my um, MOs in life is like, I have a strong sense of deference to the youth. Mm -hmm. so I just I, and I, I just said, you know what? I thought about this quote. I think by it was either I think by Booker T. Washington, "Drop your bucket where you are." I think he said it with some old, older English language. I think it was a "thou" in there or something. But essentially, like I was able, I was there. So I signed up to be a teacher. Went through a teacher pro program and like started over. And so here and more recently, 
have been trying to find a place for the union between my teaching practice and my art. And I think I'm finally starting to, to get there. I think I've been, um, I think my stance is that I am an activist with a classroom and a canvas. So it took me a long time to come up with that little bitty sentence. It took years to finally arrive there, but that's where I am now. Well, I mean, you're, you're finally there and uh, <laughs> life's journey can take you a lot of different places. And I've seen sort of your, your social media posts and uh, man, I can tell just from sort of how your students interact with you that you really make an impact on their life. So I'm so glad that you arrived where you are now. Um, so let's let's jump a little bit more now that we've had sort of a, a developed a foundation in your background. Let's talk more about your work, just in terms of how you chose the medium of your work, and also sort of um, the intended meaning of your work. How you arrived to um, sort of the context that your art's been created in. Uh, thank you for asking that question. A quick aside about medium. My, I had some really, really amazing art professors at Henderson State University. Go Reddies, um, David Stoddard, um, Gary Simmons, Nancy Dunaway, Catherine Strauss, Ed Martin, Beverly Bies. Um, I, I had an art history teacher. I can't remember her name right now, but I'm sorry. Um, Summer Brooke, Aaron Calvert, really, they were just like true artists. Mm -hmm. and so they always used to get on me um, about medium. So I operate in so many different mediums. And the main critique that I've always gotten, which is a fair critique, this is not me like trying to castigate them or anything. But the critique was, how will anybody notice your work? Like every two to three years or on a whim, it's a completely different style. So like if you look at my work in the last, what, 10 years, there's like three really totally different styles, looks like from three different artists. But something that comforts me and something that Carrie James Marshall said that an artist has to understand um, that medium, the range in medium and its connection to meaning. So I, my medium of choice comes in my understanding of what I want to articulate in meaning. Mm -hmm. So with this project, Boys to Black Men, The Seer is a Keeper of His Dreams is much different than the first iteration that um, I showed at a Wachita Baptist, which is right across the street um, shout out to Summer Brooke, but the first iteration was black and white drawings. And the second iteration was almost like cartoon like. Mm -hmm. So um, what I was trying to convey in the most recent iteration with like the eyes and stuff in the background and the fact that it is like cartoon like. Um, I'm a big fan of Japanese art. Um, I share on my screen some yeah, images please, please. that people can reference. Yeah, I don't know which one you're going to share, but go ahead. <laughs> All right. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. There we go. We have some that one. And I like how it's you and your work. I just think it's a really impactful photograph. Yeah. Um, these are my students. I taught every, every last one of these boys. Um, so. uh, from the that's, that's Carter, mm -hmm. not the pink. Let's see if we can find any more images. That's Jonathan. That's the, I don't know what I was saying then, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you are speaking to a group of- Yeah. <laughs> and of so course- UAPB, right? I think they were from UAPB. Yes, yeah, then they were just absorbing everything here let's see if we can get some more oh and these are um just to, to contextualize for viewers um, we also asked visitors to answer the same questions that you posed to your interviewees 
Mm. And we have some of their responses. It's kind of like a predecessor. Mm -hmm. That's Okay, I'll bring it back to the first image, though, so that you can talk more about your work. Okay. Um, so another quick aside. These are my students. I don't paint. I don't like painting people I don't know. I have to have a, some kind of emotional connection to my subjects. And Boys to Black Men, where it started, my inquiry into this work started with the shooting death of Michael Brown. And I started to think about the boys I interacted with every day. And I do understand that in this work, it is, it excludes um, black women, black um, queer, um, black trans men and women, but um, you can, you can leave it up if you, if you like, or you know, it kind of helps me talk about it if I can look at it. Cause yeah, the, of course. Well then I'll... the paintings are at my mom's house. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll share again. Here we go. Yeah. So I understand understand that I, ch I chose to focus on only boys, not, not in the sense that their experience was um, so much different than other people who are outside of those groups, like their lives are not, are less important. It's just that at that time in 2016, or was this 2014? It was, it was no, I began this in 2014, yes. Yeah. At that time, it was about them. And I remember a lot of my boys talking about it. And so I decided to, you know, explore ideas of visibility, invisibility, um, who's telling the story, who doesn't get to tell the story. So a lot of narratives about black boys, black people in general, a lot of narratives are communicated via the news. And so it, what I wanted to address was the gaze, like this universal gaze um, that all of us have, not just non-Black people, but even Black people too, this gaze of like Black boyhood, Black boys becoming men and how there are, that, that in itself is kind of politicized and how, how do we allow do we allow black boys to be kids? What well, saying? I don't think that's true. I, I think anyone can say that the experience for emerging black men is quite different from the experience of any other racial group of people. So, what I wanted to do with this project was return the narrative voice, the person telling the story to the black boy. And so I just asked a series of questions and they gave me their answer. And I try my best not to manipulate any of their answers, like whatever their responses are, I'm like, okay. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to ch take out my, uh, um, my subjectivity even in my interacting with them, right? So like I have, you know, would interact with them. Some of these boys are in my, grew up in my neighborhood from my hometowns. And so I know them. And then like on social media, like I might see them doing all kinds of various activities that people would assign criminality to, mm -hmm. however, we don't allow black boys or to be reckless in the same way that we allow black, I mean, white boys to be reckless, you know, like Brock Short, I think the judge was like, he made a mistake, right? So yeah, you know, the parameters, 
<laughs> the parameters for Black boy existence is really rigid and policed in ways that white boys aren't policed. So um, the eyes, I do want to speak about the eyes. The eyes are there's, I think there's two things happening here. My thoughts were, one, I like to be, sh my students call me very shady. They call me shady. So <laughs> I, I like to, I wanted to make a mockery of mm -hmm. this, this gaze. Um, and specifically the white gaze. Mm -hmm. So like, it, if you see these boys, like their portraits, are soft, somber, and kind of just like they're themselves. Um, but then you have these really expressionistic eyes in the background, like fearful, confused, and all of these different emotions that people, these, this, these emotional responses that people may feel, like immediately feel in when they encounter Black boys and young Black mm -hmm. men. So I wanted to put those two things just together and like force the, the audience to confront those things, to confront those emotional responses to young black boys and, and young black men. And like, where do they come from? And it's, it's a, like an invitation to do a little bit of, you know, some identity work. And I know that at least whenever I discuss this with you um, during the reception of your exhibition, you were talking about how um, you did make decisions in terms of the number of eyes for the individual boys or the, mm -hmm. um, would you want to talk about that a little bit? Yes, yeah, sure. I forgot all about that. Thank you. If you, most of the portraits have between like um, six to eight eyes. But one that I, there's one portrait, Albert, the one who's in orange with the love winds on the shirt. I chose to have more eyes than any of the paintings on him because of the, this extra layer of queer, of queerness. So like being a black boy, but also a gay black boy, that in is an invitation to so many other things from all from all um sides especially like it's not just um limited to to white people like a black gay boy also warrants a gaze from like even within the black community mm -hmm. like homophobia doesn't just doesn't just reside within um the white community. So like, I think what you have is like all of these intersections of racial groups. So like he has that added layer to his identity and then brings in um, other people viewing, viewing him and making presumptions about who he is and his worth. So we, we talked a little bit, of, him and I talked about that and he's the kind of person that doesn't care what anybody thinks. I mean, this, um, the funniest story I can remember about him, and usually it almost is like the stories about all of, all of my boys, actually. For some reason, I'm attracted to the ones that people would probably label as like troublemakers. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I think those are the ones, I heard a quote last week Someone said that I love children because they're so they're the closest to their humanity. And the these these boys, they've had like behavior issues in school, uh, been labeled a certain way for, for most of them. Not all of them, but like most of them. And I I really like people like that because I think that they're leaders and they're just they're not not even misguided, but uh, misunderstood. Like I like, I'm attracted to people who don't value respectability politics. And so they operate on their own terms. But the funniest story I remember about Albert is he set a trash can on fire once in school. <laughs> and everybody was like, what? 
oh <laughs> but it was an act of resistance. Mm -hmm. um, it's a whole backstory, but it, it was an act of resistance. So with him, he's, 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 well, he's explained to me that how he gets judged like extra because he's gay. Mm. Or like people's distance is increased because he's gay. Like people don't interact with him in the ways that they would interact with other black boys because he's gay. So that's why I chose extra eyes are on him. I believe that's incredibly thoughtful and especially with um, now and current times we have uh, not only the the protests which is bringing resurgence and awareness and education but also it's pride month yeah <laughs> yeah what an amazing intersection um so let's dive a little bit more into uh what your thought process is now in response to current events in response to the to the protests in response to uh, it being Pride Month, and then also, do you think that moving forward, what you've learned from this exhibition that you had, um, you know, what what worked, what didn't work, and and how that's going to affect your projects uh, in the future? You might have to repeat that second question to me yeah. when we get there. Mark, <laughs> we're totally fine. Well, about what worked, what didn't work. Um, you add, can you, from my understanding, you said. Can I explain like how this connects to what's happening right now? Yeah, and I mean that that in itself. I didn't need to add in any more. That was okay. Okay. Was loaded. Yeah. So you you handle as you see fit because that was a a three parter, and I think the first question in itself is going to take a fair amount of time, rightfully so. Okay, I think the same thing that I saw in some of these boys were cries for visibility. So whether you got kicked out of class or suspended or whatever, whatever act, some of it, like a lot of it is a cry for visibility. So if like in education class, there's a certain expectation for how children should behave in classrooms. But if one, if a child doesn't fit within the confines of those expectations, then you might see that that child as like um, bad, quote unquote. And so when they do the behave in these ways that you don't approve of, I call them cries of visibility. Um, school, a classroom teacher might call it disruptive, right? So I kind of attach myself to the disruptors because I think that there's something that they're saying there. And I think when we focus on I was watching, it's this woman, I think she's a life coach. Her name is Rachel Rogers. I was watching her Instagram message before our meeting. And what she said was, it's like every time we call on like kindness, peace and respectability. And as in response to this, we are really propping up um, effed up systems that eventually leave black bodies dead in the street. So um, it makes me think about um, the protests that are happening right now um, and the uprisings. I don't want to like, I think the, the media is trying to, you know, name it as riots and things like that, but they're really cries for visibility and so if we, if we get caught up, I think in a rabbit hole of like how people are crying out for visibility, then I think we misunderstand um, their message. So I think we are, right now we're being invited to discover our relationship to our ideas and practices that we have with the system of oppression. So one of the main questions that I was talking to my partner about before our meeting today, I think we're asking the wrong question when we ask, am I a racist 
or not, or saying someone is racist or saying someone is not. And I, th it's, I think it's a little bit controversial though, what, I, what I'm going to say, but I'm gonna try to articulate as best way as I can. I don't think if we that, that those conversations I think are futile and really underestimate the systems societal norms that that uphold racism it really underestimates the power of racism by saying okay this is this person racist or not because i don't think one person has the power, like the complete absolute power to be racist. However, I do think some people's re relationship to racist ideals and systems are a lot closer in proximity. So I think the question that we should all ask ourselves is what is my relationship to racism? And so um, let me go first, look at my notes. Um, do I have access to the power in the system, right? So like, you have to th think about it like a family tree. So like you can map your family tree from great, great, great grandmother, whatever, blah, 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 on down to whomever, uncles, aunties, and this, this, and that. So if we think about our proximity in that way, then and considering that white people are like the sons and daughters of racism in this country, mm -hmm. then asking yourself, well, I'm not a racist. I, I, I think that is like very shallow of a question to ask because you racist, racism is, to really unpack and understand racism, you have to do identity work. You gotta do some unpacking within your own identity. What are the structures of your own identity? So like, if you're, like think about our, pol our um, police system. If the police system was designed to protect white people and their things, or designed to catch enslaved runaways. It was designed on systems of oppression. So you have to ask like, could that be your great, great uncle? If you're, if you're, if you're thinking about your, your proximity or relationship to racism. So like, I think you have to also ask what is your position in society and our position are made up are of, of different things like our socioeconomic status, right? So are you a CEO at a Fortune 500 company? Are you a manager? Are you someone who's working class? Like where are you in position and how close are you to accessing power? So like, are you calling the cops as a, as a way to use your power against black people or people of color. So like Amy Cooper knew exactly what she was doing. She was accessing a system of power in which she knew would protect her as a white woman. And what she knew if the cops actually came out there could be detrimental to uh, the black man she called Cooper. I don't remember his first name, Mr. Cooper. Um, she knew it would be harmful harmful to him. And she claimed that she wasn't a racist. But when we make those claims, but she knew that she had access to that system of power. So that's why I say like, asking yourself that question is is so shallow. And that's a futile conversation you really have to and I don't think that that question can be limited to just, you know, just white people. Um, I'm not trying to insinuate that, like, I know there's a d the debate, like, Black people can't be racist, these people can't be racist, but, and I, again, I think just to think that's the wrong question, so, like, I think about, um, think about whatever, a, a school that I 
that someone can work at. You can have all black staff, black teachers, black students, however, and, and like a black principal. But if you are making decisions that ultimately keep certain people out and in, then you are still reinforcing those systems of oppression, right? So you have to ask yourself, where, where do you fall? And for white people, it could look like, hmm, are you giving referrals? Are you advocating? Like, I think to like really start to unpack some of these things about when you think when you think about your, your yourself as someone who has access, mm -hmm. like what what are you what how does your way of life what are you doing to contribute? or dismantle systems of oppression. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt in any way, but we do, we're right now limited, sadly. We have two minutes left. Okay. If you wanna do any closing remarks, I'm, I'm leaving it to you. Um, let me see, I had a question. I, I think I'll just leave with a question. If any, anyone trying to do like this identity work. Um, I think that racism is like a spectrum, like an X and Y graph. So like if racism is at the center, you have to figure out where are you plotted on this graph. Um, and I think that identity work is an act of patriotism. I think that's really, when I ask myself, what is my personal relationship to America. I think it is connected to my ability to have free speech. Whereas some other person's connection might be to the American flag. But I, we have to move beyond civil, symbolism, move beyond sentiment. Like, oh my gosh, I can't understand. It's just so horrible. You have to move beyond sentiment. And mm -hmm. what that looks like is I think asking yourself the question, what is my relationship to the ideas and practices of systems of oppression? I think that's a beautiful, well said question. And um, I can't thank you enough for participating in this and um, for being active in the conversation.